Well, over in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, in the English Standard Version, it says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And like I said, I used the English Standard Version there. <clears throat> but Paul commands the Philippians that their reasonableness should be known to everyone. It's translated re reasonableness in the English Standard Version, but in other translations it's translated as moderation in the King James Version. It's translated as gentleness in the New King James Version and the New International Version and gentle spirit in the New American Standard 1995. So this word has some variance with how it's translated just in this passage, uh, not to mention <clears throat> in the rest of Scripture. It's not a word that is used a lot in Scripture, um, but in the places where it is used, it does have the same amount of <clears throat> variance. This word that is used is, when you look in concordances for how they would define it, various concordances give it the definition of seemly, equitable, and fitting. Seemly, equitable, and fitting. One concordance said that it is giving justice beyond that of ordinary justice. Uh, it's along the idea of treating somebody with the utmost fairness and uh, equitableness. And that's what reasonableness is in this passage. And I want you to consider also some words that the New Testament uses to describe Christians as we're thinking about this idea of reasonableness. Consider also these words used in the New Testament to describe what Christians should be. The word temperate is used, and you'll notice that <clears throat> that's used in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 and verse 11. That's a, a word that is used to describe elders and, uh, I believe, deacons' wives, um, but just because in that passage it's used to talk about uh, elders and deacons' wives does not mean that it's something that, you know, we don't have to do or we don't have to be. Uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse 2, it is used a little bit more generically um, to talk <clears throat> about something that Christians should be as well. Uh, that word temperate is also translated as sober-minded. Prudent is used, also respectable, sensible, self-controlled, and dignified. All of these words, I think, hit the kind of general area of the, the, the quality that I want to talk about this morning. Reasonable, temperate, prudent, respectable, sensible, self-controlled, dignified. All of these things, uh, I think, are describing the same kind of quality. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to put that all on, under the umbrella, umbrella of the word reasonableness this morning. When we consider all the things that a Christian is supposed to be, is it possible that we can forget this quality? We talk, <clears throat> can talk about how a Christian is supposed to be holy, how they're supposed to be faithful or full of faith. Uh, they are supposed to have faith in the Lord. Talk, talk about how a Christian is supposed to be loving. But reasonable, you might not hear so much about. But well, Christians are indeed supposed to be reasonable people, and according to Paul, that quality of reasonableness among us should be known to everyone. And so this morning I want to talk about that quality of reasonableness. What is it, and how can a Christian practice it in their lives? How can we let our reasonableness be known to everyone? The first point I'd like to make about reasonableness is being reasonable is being willing to listen to others <coughs> to a point. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. I think this passage in Acts chapter 17 is a good 
a good example of both what not to be and what to be as Christians. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 1. Now when they had tra traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. <coughs> and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, attacking the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they, they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king. Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the world with the word with great eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so you have a contrast here of the Jews from Thessalonica to the Jews who are from Berea. On the one hand, we have people who were unwilling to listen to Paul, inciting a violent riot in Thessalonica. And on the other, we have people who are willing to listen and are weighing what Paul says against evidence. One point I'd like to make here very briefly is that reasonableness is not gullibility. That these Bereans were not just eating up whatever Paul had to say with no, no evidence, no thought to whether it's true or not. No, they were, yes, eagerly receiving his word, but they were examining the scriptures to see whether the things he was saying was so. But I also want to notice the motivations slash emotions behind the respective groups. The Jews in Thessalonica were motivated by jealousy, whereas the Bereans are eager to hear what Paul has to say. And so again, I think in this example you can see a, a stark contrast, a clear contrast of what a Christian should not be, what is unreasonable, and what a Christian should be, what is reasonable. I do like the phrase that is translated in, in uh, my Bible as noble-minded. When you look in the Greek, it's just noble, and, and there's uh, kind of an added on to it. But it, I think it's a, a good translation, that they were noble-minded, or some translations read fair-minded. That's the kind of reasonableness that we're looking at. And yet... <clears throat> As I look through the rest of the scriptures, there are some things that a person should not listen to, and a reasonable person will not listen to. For example, foolish controversies. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Paul says here in verse 9, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. By avoiding them, he's essentially telling Titus to not listen to them. 2 Timothy chapter 2 has a similar admonition, this time from Paul to Timothy, another one of his protégés. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 23, Paul tells Timothy, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. So foolish controversies, foolish speculations, genealogies, strife about the, the law, things uh, that were 
you know, hot topics of the day, certain things of, of that manner, Paul told Timothy and Titus to stay away from. We should also stay away from gossip and slander. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. In verse 19, it says, He who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. And then a few chapters over in Proverbs 17, Proverbs 17 and verse 4 says, An evildoer listens to wicked lips. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. And so in these words of wisdom that Solomon is imparting, he says, essentially he's saying, don't listen to a slanderer. Don't associate with a gossip. You're an evildoer and a liar if you pay attention to wicked lips and a destructive tongue. And also false teachers are something that should not be listened to. In Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1 and verse 10. Paul says there, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, <coughs> teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. So Paul talks about false teachers, specifically false teachers from the circumcision, who he calls empty talkers, who he calls deceivers, and he says that they must be silenced. Well, how is Paul planning on silencing them? Is he planning on taking them by force, by being violent? No. I would argue that Paul is using two things. One, speaking the truth, which he tells Titus to do, speaking the truth and teaching people the truth, but also not listening to them. The best way that you can silence a person is not listen to them. They'll stop talking if they have nowhere to go. And the bottom line is this, is that a reasonable, per, a reasonable person is the one who takes in information that is given to them, they properly appraise it, and they act accordingly. Yes, we should be willing to listen to anyone, at least at first, we should be open-minded, noble-minded, fair-minded like the Bereans. But again, that does not mean that we're gullible. That does not mean that we're just listening to everything. We properly appraise it. Is this foolish? Is this gossip or slander? Is it false teaching? And then we say, well, if it's these things, then I'm not going to listen to it. But if it's good, if it's wholesome, if it's noble then I'm going to listen to it. A reasonable person does not believe everything he hears on the news or reads on the internet. A reasonable person is not obsessed with hearing the latest conspiracy theory or piece of gossip. A reasonable person knows what needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but... A reasonable person is not someone who needs to be taken with a grain of salt themselves. You think about that. Do you know people who, when, when they're talking, you know you need to take them with a grain of salt and not just outright believe everything they say or know that there's maybe another side to the story? I know people like that. Christians aren't supposed to be like that. There is a reasonableness among, that should be among Christians that people should respect and know. Another thing is, being reasonable is living Romans 12, 18. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 12. 
and verse 18. Paul says here, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now the reason that I just simply stated living Romans 12, 18 is because that's easier than saying, well, if possible, as much as it depends on you, all these caveats. Paul knew, Paul knows that it's not always possible to be at peace with all men. Because not everybody's reasonable. But you, as much as it depends on you, you're to be reasonable. And you are to be at peace with all men. And there's a list of qualities along with that that a Christian should not be, as well as a list of qualities that a Christian should be. A Christian, based on these verses, not somebody who's easily provoked. If you turn with me to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. And look at verse 16. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16. A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man conceals dishonor. A reasonable person is not going to fly off the handle. Even if they're insulted. Uh, a prudent man just conceals dishonor is the way that my translation reads it. But the English Standard Version says that, <clears throat> and I'm paraphrasing here, but they do, they do not uh, you know, become angry all of a sudden at an insult. And that's the idea here, is that even when insulted, a wise person, a reasonable person, a sensible person, is able to take that and, and not fly off the handle, not become easily angered. But a fool's anger is known all at once. Also, it's not someone who is seeking to cause strife. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3. You might keep a marker in Proverbs. We will be back. <clears throat> Turn with me to Titus chapter 3. And verse 10. We read verse 9 just a moment ago, but here's verse 10. Reject a factious man or a divisive man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Paul tells Titus, Stay away from a divisive person. And in Proverbs chapter 6, and verse 16, Solomon says, There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, which are an abomination to Him. And we go down to verse 19, and we see a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. There's some people who just like to cause problems, who like to cause strife and divisions among others. And there are various motivations for doing so. One is jealousy and envy. One is selfishness and pride and mixed up in, in boredom. And various other things as well. But a Christian is not one of those people. A Christian is not looking to cause division and strife wherever they go. And it also means not being hateful and bitter. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We read this in Bible class this morning. Byron and I just happened to kind of be on the same, same wavelength on some things this morning. But in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31, Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. You know, we, in, in Bible class this morning, we were talking about bitterness in the home, but bitterness is not just something that can be seen in the home or, or 
is exclusive to being in the home, but rather some people can be just bitter at life and bitter toward everyone around them. Someone who has taken in what life has had to give them and, and they feel slighted in some way and so they just become bitter and hateful. You might think about that neighbor of yours that if your yard gets, gets above two inches long, they're going to call the HOA and report you. Not because they care about how, how well your yard, yard looks, but just for spite. You can probably think of people like this who, who fit the bill of, of people who are just hateful people that spread hatred to, to anyone who comes into their path, whether they, they know you or not or have given you a chance or not. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, it says this, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. The hateful, bitter, old, cranky person is not something that a Christian should be. And yet, maybe I've, I've met Christians and maybe you've met Christians who do fit that description. So not easily provoked, not seeking to cause strife and not hateful or, or bitter, but rather someone who is patient. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll start reading in verse 1. When we think about someone who is living, Romans 12, 18, who is striving to be at peace with all men, there are some qualities that stand out. Patience is one of them. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, Implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. In contrast to the one who is easily provoked, someone who is reasonable is patient and realizes even if you've just said something extremely rude to them, that there may be a variety of reasons for that. Maybe you, you didn't realize that you were being rude. Maybe you've had a bad day. And so on and so forth. But with patience, there's also giving preference. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, In verse 10, Paul says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. And I think Paul better explains this concept over in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul says there, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ... If there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests but also for the interests of others. If you want to talk about what giving preference means, it's this, what we see in verse 3 and 4. You regard one another as more important than yourselves, not looking out only for your own personal interests, but for their personal interests as well. And I would say putting their personal interests above your own is giving preference. <laughs> And that's what you can see in a reasonable person. And then in Colossians chapter 3, there's another quality that we see in being reasonable as well. Colossians chapter 3, 
and verse 12. Paul says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So a reasonable person, they're not quick to fly off the handle when they've been wronged, but if they have indeed been wronged, they're willing to forgive as well. These qualities are something that you'll find in the kind of person that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. Where, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, you be at peace with all men. This is how. Putting off these qualities of being easily provoked and causing strife and being hateful and bitter, but rather being patient and giving preference and forgiving. And as we continue to look at being reasonable, we should also consider that being reasonable is dwelling on the right things. If you turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Just a few verses down from where Paul talks about letting your reasonableness be known to all men. He says in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. I would suggest to you that being reasonable takes practice. It is a discipline of the mind that requires constant tuning. And yet, even though this is the case, that reasonable, the reasonableness takes practice, it could also be said that anyone can be a reasonable person. And thankfully, the scriptures offer us the tools that we need in order to train our minds in order to be reasonable people. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. Paul talks about the kind of training of the mind that we need to be doing in order to be the kind of people that we need to be. In verse 6 of 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. You notice in verse 7, we have a, another warning to stay away from things, kind of hearkening back to our first point. He says, have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. Stay away from the, that foolish stuff. But... He says, train up your mind, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. <coughs> so we can do that. We can train our minds. We can discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, I found this wording quite interesting. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. It says, The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. We're called to be steadfast in our minds. Disciplined in our minds and how we think and how, what, what we dwell on. And if you'll turn to Psalm 119... Psalm 119, 
tells us what these scriptures can do for our minds. Psalm 119, starting in verse 97. He says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. As we dwell on the scriptures, as we dwell on those things that are honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellent, worthy of praise. As we meditate them all, on, all, on them all the day, as it talks about in Psalm 119 verse 97. We can expect to become more reasonable people. And it may be said of, of us that we are wiser than our enemies. That we have more insight than our teachers. That we understand more than the aged. In some cases, yes, that will be true. Because this quality of reasonableness is not found in the world in a lot of cases. There are not many reasonable people out there in the world. But with the word of the Lord, we can become the, that kind of people ourselves. So I hope that this has been helpful to you and insightful to you. Let us strive to let our reasonableness be known to everyone. Christians should be known as reasonable people. Not people who you have to take with a grain of salt. Not people who, when you see them walking down the street or coming into the the store or the restaurant say, oh boy, here comes another story. That's not really the kind of people that we're supposed to be. I want to take you to one more passage this morning. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Look at verse 28. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You remember some of the words that we use to talk about what reasonableness is? How it's translated? Gentle, equitable, fair, seemly, fitting. The quality that we're talking about today is found in our Lord Jesus. As evidenced by this passage as well as others. Jesus is not like the lords and masters of this earth, which... By the way, you can look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, where the word that we've been talking about is, trans, is contrasted with someone who is unreasonable, and it's talking about an unreasonable master. Well, Jesus is not an unreasonable master. Rather, he is equitable, he is seemly, he is fitting. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. And if you will turn to him and you will learn his ways and you will put them into your heart, not only can you become a reasonable person, but you can have a lasting life. And so I'd urge you this morning to look to the example of Jesus and look to him for everything that you need. 
If you have not put on Christ in baptism this morning, there's an opportunity for you to do so. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you are willing to repent of your sins, if you are willing to confess that Jesus is the Son of God before men, then you can put Him on in baptism, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And once you have been born again, born of water and of spirit, then yes, Jesus will be your master and His yoke is easy and His burden is light. And you must follow Him all of your days. Yes, absolutely. But that leads to things so much better than we can ever imagine, including eternal life in heaven someday with Him. If you are a Christian and perhaps you have not been living the life that you should, maybe you thought about it and you realize, you know what, I have not been a reasonable person. Well, it's not too late for you. You can make repentance and confess that to the Lord. Ask Him to forgive you. And then set your life straight from there, working on becoming more like Jesus. If you have any need this morning, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?